Michael Jackson's monster thriller album has gone on to become the biggest seller in recorded history and was on top of the countdown charts for 11 weeks. 1983 and Countdown opened up with his royal badness, who has since become one of the world's hottest acts. Michael Jackson mania is everywhere. But I work at Billboard at the time. One of the really ballsy things I thought about the marketing of Purple Rain was, and Billboard does this huge Michael Jackson special, he sold all these records, but the last page of, the, of Billboard, I'll never forget it, was a giant ad for Purple Rain. The, the rain coming down? And it says, the Purple Rain will begin on blah, blah, blah. I was like, that's ballsy. Because basically it was like, you jump in the middle of a Michael Jackson celebration and you plant the Prince flag. Well, you, you gotta remember that, you know, Thriller, you know, the setup for Purple Rain was also Thriller. You know, you had Mike, you know, Michael making that mini movie. Right. So it was always, you know, Prince was very competitive. Uh, I called him the Muhammad Ali of rock and roll. I mean, he really, took it to everybody all the time. <laughs> the best way I can describe it, there, there was, especially back in the day when, when radio was more of a factor than it is now, um, sometimes you would have this phenomenon where, you know, the, the, one of the marquee artists came out with a record in a specific sort of period of time with the expectation that, you know, the single or the album, whatever, it's going to at some point hit and occupy the number one spot. But then you have this situation where there's someone blocking you, where there's mm. someone sitting at number one and you just can't dislodge them. To a great degree, that was the vibe between Prince and Michael. The same dynamic that took place between Rick and Prince, more so at a distance, I think, was at work. Because again, you got guys that are extremely competitive, extremely driven, want to be number one, period. So they can't both be number one. You're talking about Larry Graham or Sly or somebody <laughs> like that. That's what made me want to play the bass. And if I do that, and it, that inspires me to do something, that's that as cool. Stevie Wonder, Songs in the Key of Life, Talking Book, Fantastic. And hearing his music made me say to myself, I can do this. Uh, Aretha Franklin, every three months there's a new album. James Brown, every three months there's a new single and album. No. The real entertainers, man. The real was make you get goosebumps. Yeah, it was. If I'd been in that time period, but then again, competition would have been more fierce too. I think James Brown is a genius. You uh -huh. know, when he's with the famous flame, it's just unbelievable. James Brown played a big influence on my style. When I was about ten years old, my stepdad put me on the stage with him. And I danced a little bit until the bodyguard took me off. We used to have to go on stage after him live at the Apollo. He would come on, and we would come on amateur hour. On my way backstage, on my way out, I saw some of the finest dancing girls I've ever seen in my life. He influenced me by his control over his group. They were like in a trance, and they had the audience in the palm of their hand. I just love how they could control them like that. I'd be in the wings just studying every step. Wow. I've never seen nothing like that. That kind of emotion, that kind of fever, feeling. It was, it was like on another higher spiritual plane they were on. You know, and he, he practiced us with a belt in his hand. And if you miss a step, Expect to be, uh, and he would tear you up if you missed. Not only were we practicing, we were nervous rehearsing because he sat in the chair and he had this bell in his hand. And if you didn't do it the right way, he would tear you up. My father used to always say, don't mess up, you know? And I felt I knew all, every part. And if, and if something went wrong, I felt I could cover it. Um, how can I put this? My father was he was so hard on me. He, he, I was never good enough. And there was something about that, it was like, almost like the army when it came to music. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a fighter, I'm very competitive. I think from him being so hard on me, that the one thing I got out of it is I understood that um, in, his, uh, in his harshness, he wanted me to excel. Mm -hmm. He used to say things like, um, don't ever get a girl pregnant. Don't ever get married, you know. 
don't uh, this, so many, don't that. Just... Uh. That's the deprivation of a man. And this is the thing he's saying about uh, it's the word can't to make your soul sing. regime of getting ready it was the wrong audience and they were all like mm. old and in like polyester suits so it was just the wrong crowd we had no idea mm -hmm. that um he was going to be called up when all of this went on with michael he was just sitting there like oh god he had no other choice and then he went through these shenanigans with chick they, they thought prince was weird from before he even got on the stage with the name alone because there were so many negative things about him so they weren't necessarily that supportive mm -hmm. so when he walked through the crowd and he did these whole shenanigans Prince always looked like that so it wasn't like he was prepared for stage even though it looked like he was during those days it was very very choreographed and structured about mm -hmm. how he liked things to be and you know, he just kind of, kind of choked. Love that kind of stuff because here he is, the only one. He wasn't ready to pass the baton to Michael, to Prince, to nobody. So he was kind of like, let me let, let me let me see. He just really kind of froze, and then the baton was out of tune. So it was a little bit weird, and I think it made it really difficult for Prince to go to shows without guarantees that people weren't going to put him on the spot. Michael was because even after he'd left Motown, he still would come and talk to Barry yeah. and get advice. Yeah. So he he just didn't want anyone else to be, you know, he had to also see the good too. So it was definitely shady. Everybody was more pro Michael. Yeah. But Michael, it was a little, it might have been a little shady. It was just a real lot of, kind of a little pissing match going on. 
Prince got on stage and um, knocked over that light pole and really, really messed up badly and embarrassed himself. Prince used to watch that videotape. Uh, you know, Prince Prince knew exactly what Michael was up to. I said, don't you guys just want to be viewed as friends? Because I had seen them together. I said, you know, don't, don't you want people to know you're friends? <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget the look Prince gave me. And he just kind of turned around and he just said, don't be naive. Yeah. Asking me because he wants me to be his friend. This is competition. I'm scared, weren't you? Yeah. I'm scared. I've seen a video of him and James Brown game. He's always had this thing that's all over him. But Michael had 25 years of experience, and Prince had five years. And so Michael went up there, and, and, and that, in the video, you'll see that. He sang, he sang for about 15 seconds, and then he just moved off himself for 15 seconds and picked up the tempo. And then he whispered in, in James Brown's ear, and said, bring up, bring Prince to come up. Prince jumped on the back of his bodyguard, took the glove, threw him off, and then threw him back at him. And came up there and stopped, stopped and challenged Michael. That's not the way you do cameos, man. You join the family, you know. You don't want to run to fight each other or compete with each other. And we made a fool out of himself. He was well aware that he had messed up. Uh, Jesse Johnson told me a story that after that show, the Time and Prince, some of Prince's band members, they were all together. Prince said to everyone in his circle, "That was bad, wasn't it? I really messed up tonight. That was bad." Jesse told me, every single person said to him, no, Prince, that was great. Jesse said to me that he looked at Prince and he realized in that moment that Prince knew there is no one in my circle who will tell me the truth. But, you know, I think they kind of squashed it. Prince told me that he went and met with Michael at some point. It was an interesting meeting. No rivalry. Now. So was there a subtle rivalry? I, I would say a subtle internalized. It wasn't overt. It wasn't outward. Did it get talked about from time to time? Yeah, yeah, it came up from time to time. I, you know what I think for me, and, and I'm going to share this because this has more to do with, with, with me than the Prince, but it tells the story. After I left the band, I was doing my Modern Airs solo thing. I, I'm the special guest on the Billy Idol Rebel Yell Tour. Um, playing a show in Fresno, California. I come off stage after my set's done, and I, I, at that point, I had the same management as Prince does. And the, the woman from the management company who was on the road with us came up to me within minutes after I got off stage and said, hey, wanted to tell you, you know, we got a call from Michael Jackson's office this afternoon. He wanted to come out to see your show, but we told him, no, we didn't want to have to babysit. There was a, a subtle attitude that kind of permeated of, of competition to some degree. And I think that story kind of underscores what that was about. And, and yes, I was very angry. And not to try and take anything from Michael, don't get me wrong, one of the greatest that ever walked the planet, Prince, I mean, was the whole package. Musically, I find a lot of things, uh, a lot of things I've heard before. Honestly, I think, you know, he's a okay piano player. I think of Prince as a, a person that knows some cards, some piano cards. A lot of that stuff really came about later. Uh, somebody bring me a mirror. Jerome was always kind of a roadie in the old days. So he was organizing stuff and making sure everything was packed up and, you know, that kind of thing. We had already been on tour, rehearsing again, revamping the show. He was at every rehearsal. We used to rehearse at this little uh, rehearsal hall. Called the Yasm. It's called the Yasm in South Minneapolis. And I forget what that was, something backwards, I'm sure. But anyway, and I'm like, somebody bring me a mirror. On the sides of this club, there were all these big mirrors, like big mirrors, like hanging mirrors. The next thing we see, Jerome goes to the wall, pulls this big ass mirror, puts it in front of Morris. And then next thing I know, he's standing in front of me with the mirror. And all the guys were just kind of looking at each other like, this shit's pretty cool, man. Morris, Morris starts primping his hair and doing, you know, fixing his tie. And Prince falls out on the floor laughing. And he just goes, ah, ha, ha, we're adding that to the show. That's it, that's it. From that moment on, he became Jerome the Mere Man Benton. So Jerome went from being, at that time, he was like our valet. You know, he did all the luggage and all that stuff. So he, that was his introduction to the stage, man. He was, he was in after that. 